1 Peter 3.18 says that Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, to bring you to God. To bring you to God in his presence. And one day, we'll be in heaven in his presence. But now, we seek to walk in his presence. Of course, we know the Bible says that your sins have separated you from your God. Sin separates us from God's presence. And it cuts us off from God. We're not, we, we, we don't have a relationship with God. We're not walking in God's presence when we're in sin. In fact, a great picture of that is in the very first pages of your Bible. Remember Adam and Eve? They walked in the garden with God. And then what happened when sin came? When they fell into sin, they were cast out of the presence of God. The whole story of salvation and redemption is to restore us where we can walk with and experience God's presence. Now, when we think about God's presence, I want to explain a little bit to you before we dive in. There's three measures of God's presence. These are in your notes. Three things about God's presence or three ways God's presence is measured. One, there is God's omnipresence. This means God is everywhere all the time. We may or may not know it. We may or may not experience it. But God's presence is near. When you got saved, there was this great overwhelming thing. Well, God is near. God was always near. But your sins did not allow you to experience his presence. Remember, we were just studying in the book of Acts in our Bible study lessons in Sunday school. And Paul was on, Acts, Paul was on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. He's talking to all these philosophers, these people who had all these false gods through the city. And he said something very, very uh, powerful about God and, uh, and his presence. Acts chapter 17 verse 27 says, So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God was at work to cause men to seek him, but he's not very far. He's really near. But sin puts a veil up and a barrier. The second measure of God's presence is God's cultivated presence. When we believe and are saved, this begins the cultivating of God's presence in our lives. It allows us to know God and have God live in, within us. But as you know, as a Christian, it takes more than just being saved. Now it takes prayer, prayer, walking with God, reading the word of God, worship, service, confession of my sins, fasting. All of these things help cultivate the presence of God in my life and in our church. It's seeking God. That's why the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. That's your part to get close to God. We are to cultivate that relationship with God where we can have his presence in our lives and sense his presence. Number three, God's manifest presence. This is the least common. The word manifest means to show or be seen, to make evident, to be undeniable. It's when we know God's presence is with us and real in these moments when we're somewhat, if you've ever experienced, you can be overwhelmed by God's presence. And why we need revival in the church and why we need revival in America is God's manifest presence is not being made known in America. We know he's here, he's with us, we're Christians, and yet there's something missing of the manifest presence of God where he moves among us and we fall down and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Today we're going to begin a series of messages from this study of the exodus and the wilderness wanderings. I've entitled, In His Presence. Because we're going to see that God wanted these people to be in His presence. In fact, the exodus, that story of God bringing the people out of Israel, happened because God wanted His people to be with Him. He wanted them to experience His presence and he wanted them to know how to worship him. Now think about up to this point in Exodus 32. God had worked great wonders on their behalf. He had brought them out of the bondage. He had redeemed them from the bondage of Israel. By the way, that's a great picture of salvation. How God brings us out of the bondage of sin. Brings us out of the bondage of Egypt, if you will. So he's brought them out. He's promised them his manifest presence. And he's already started showing them his presence. Back in Exodus 13, verse 21 through 22, look at these words. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead, them, to lead the way. 
and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. They look up and see God's right there with them every step of the way. God's been manifesting his presence to these people and letting them know he's promised a land that he is going to give them. He's given them his law and his commandments. He's teaching them how to live and how to worship. And instead of this being one of the most glorious times in their life, they fall into one of the most gravest sins in their history. They're on the, they're on the edge of glory and they fall back into terrible sin. We're going to study today the golden calf story. And see the seriousness, not only of what they did, but when they did it. See, not long after God gives them the Ten Commandments and he's shown them all of this, his presence, they seek a substitute God for his presence. They seek something instead of him. In place of him. And it can happen to us as individuals. It can happen to us as a church. And the Bible tells us, someone may wonder, well, how relevant is this to us? Well, the Bible specifically says these stories like this. In matter of fact, in the context of Exodus, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, all these things happen. He's talking about the Exodus in this story. All these things happen to them as examples And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. This was written for us to admonish us to learn from it and live differently than they did. So Exodus chapter 32, we're going to read the first six verses to begin. Keep your Bibles open. We're going to see if we can finish the whole chapter. Now when the people... Saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. The people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Substitute gods. This passage of scripture is, is for, it's a great and powerful reminder that man has the ability, even while he's close with God, to wander off. We have the ability, even after being saved, to have our hearts turn away. Now, when you read this story, their sin was not replacing God with another God. It was actually replacing God with the representation of God. See, the golden calf was meant to represent God. They said it right here. This is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. The power that we saw, this represents him. This is the representation of him. Now, of course, we know this is why God said not to have images and things like this, like statues and things. He says don't have them back in the Ten Commandments. You remember chapter 20 where he gave them the Ten Commandments. In the Second Commandment, he says, You shall not make for yourself the carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord, your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to those uh, showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments matter of fact that's the longest written commandment God said more about that commandment than he did any of the others because it's common for man to have an image of God there our version of God you know we have the Bible app you version if we're not careful, we'll have a God that's you version. A God that we want. And imagine how God felt. God loved these people. 
He's done a great work in their life. And now they're fashioning a God that they say this, this is him. They're, they're changing the image of the invisible God. The incorruptible God to a corruptible image made by man. Imagine how he felt as he watched these people do this and call this him. Now, it's never happened to me, I don't think, but I've heard people say that they got married and um, all of a sudden their, their spouse tried to change them. They wanted them to dress differently. They started buying clothes that they didn't wear. Now, I've seen some of these people and some of them needed somebody to dress them, <laughs> but I didn't want to tell them that. But, uh, uh, but just imagine this person tries to change everything about you. They say they love you, but you realize you're really not acceptable to them. They want to make you into something that you're not. Now, ladies, listen. (laughs) If you married Elmer Fudd, he's not not going to become Clark Gable. (laughs) Some of you younger people, listen, some of you younger ladies, if you married Steve Urkel, he, he can't become Brad Pitt. I got more. Listen, some of you Star Wars fans, if you married Yoda, you ain't getting Han Solo. But just imagine how that person feels. This is the way God felt. These people could not accept him and they wanted something else. And so they started fashioning this God into what they desired, a substitute for God's presence. This morning, let's look and see what we can learn from this text about substitute God, substituting anything for God's presence. One, substitute gods are gods that we can control. We can control. This story seems to start because Moses is taking too long on the mountain with God. Moses is up praying. He's in 40 days of prayer on the mountain with God. Imagine the pastor's praying too much. Well, that's what happened. Moses went up on the mountain in chapter 24. We get to chapter 32. He still hasn't come down. And the people are like, listen, make a God to go before us. We are ready to move. We're ready to move out. Notice, they don't even care about Moses. We don't know what happened to this fella. Don't worry about him. Just make us another God. Interestingly, they didn't ask for another leader. They asked for another God. It makes you wonder who they really were following. Maybe they, really were, maybe they really were following Moses all along. So instead of asking for a new leader, they go to these men, Aaron and her. Not her or her, but her, H-U-R, her, for some of you to know that. And they asked for a God to be fashioned for them because they were ready to move. You know, substitute gods, do, they, they work on our schedule according to our preferences, They serve us. We don't serve them. But interestingly, Jesus talked about God, the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the wind. Remember he said the wind blows where it wills. You don't know where it starts. You don't know where it ends. God can't be controlled by man. God can't be. He doesn't work on our time schedule. He doesn't work on our preferences. God's not bound to us. He doesn't serve us. We serve him. But we can fashion gods in our mind, and you'll see this in a minute. Americans do this all the time. Gods that we can control, that work on our schedule, that work according to our preferences. The second thing, substitute gods are gods we can fashion. They said, make us gods that shall go before us. The the calf was golden. It was valuable. It was common. Calves and cows were everywhere, but they were also objects of worship. Many scholars believe in Egypt. Remember, they're coming out of Egypt, and they had saw these people worship cows and calves, and so that's what Aaron substitutes. You know, a substitute God in the name of Christ, and there's many of them. Most of the cults have substitute gods in the name of Christ. Jesus is used, his name is used, but it's not the God of the Bible that they're talking about. It's not the, the, it's not the gospel that they're talking about. They have another God in the name of Christ. They preach another gospel, but it's not just people like the cults. Sometimes even in the church, we like a God that overlooks parts of the Bible that we're not necessarily comfortable with. We like a God who doesn't mention the things we don't want to face. One that's focused on what we're focused on. This is why in America we're focused on the here and now. 
we're focused on getting and gaining and living and, and having prosperity and having comfort and being healthy, wealthy. Not necessarily wise, but healthy and wealthy. This is why we have all these television programs and all of this health and wealth and this prosperity preaching because that's a God that we fashioned in America. Take that God somewhere like Haiti. You think that God could survive in Haiti? The poorest people in the world, in the Western Hemisphere, the poorest people in the world, and we're going to preach, pray, and you can be rich. Give, and you'll get. That's a God that's been fashioned right here in America. That's a God that we fashion to meet our own needs. But it's also not just those folks. Many people in the church, in the Christian church, are looking for a God who's big on grace and big on patience, but light on judgment and light on keeping his commandments. A God who understands our, our modern-day American lifestyles and our busyness and our other priorities. A God who understands our other loves and how entangled we are with this world, even though his, world, his word says a soldier of Christ shall not be entangled with the affairs of this life. A God who would never put more on us because he knows we're too weary. And we would grow really weary if, if he expected more of us. Again, that's our version of God. A God sometimes that no one ever talks about verses like this in Luke chapter 9 where Jesus said these words. Then Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Deny yourself, he says. Take up his cross daily. Die to yourself, he says. And follow me. Devote yourself, he says. Die to yourself. Deny yourself. Devote yourself. This is the God of the New Testament. This is the God of the Bible. But this is not the God that we're fashioning in America. The third thing about these gods is it's a God we can tolerate. Not only is there only, there, there's only so much of God we can handle. There's only so much of God we can handle. I was watching on YouTube this week. I've been watching some of Billy Graham's old sermons, of course, him dying. And I had watched him several years ago. But I realized it had been about two or three years since I'd watched him preach. And I pulled one up on YouTube. YouTube, you can get anything almost until they censor it. And uh, he preached in Madison Square Garden in 1957 for 16 weeks in a row. And I believe it was seven nights a week. It was definitely six nights a week because the one I watched was on Saturday night and he told those people to go to church in the morning. I was like, praise God. We can't tolerate that. We can't tolerate that much God. We can't tolerate that. That's why we have to cut everything back. That's why the church has to cut out. That's why the church has to cut back. Nobody else, by the way, is cutting out and cutting back. But everybody expects us to cut out and cut back. Listen, you ever had, your, your kids ever been signed up to a ball league and they said, hey, wait a minute, I know we were going to play 30 games. We got talking about that's too many. We're going to play 15. Anybody ever experienced that? I didn't think so. But now church, we, we have to do that because there's only so much of that we can tolerate. There's only so much, not uh, just a much of God, but only certain kind of God we can tolerate. In America, we're not, we're not really big on holy God and righteous God. In America, we've been Americanized, not Christianized, and we kind of like a God who will exclude no one, no matter how they live or even what they believe. And we want a God who, in the end, will overlook what we've done and let us all in. And if we've even gave a wink to Jesus anywhere in life, we want to be able to say, hey, they went to heaven. We know they, they, yeah, they said they believed in Jesus. But the Bible doesn't teach this, folks. Listen to me. I'm telling you, I know God's a God of grace. And I know he's a God of love. But you know, grace was not given so you could live like hell and go to heaven. Grace was so you can live like God and not have to live like hell. Listen, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says this. Do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now look at these words. Do not be deceived. You know why he put that in there? Not, because they were, not just because there were outside influences deceiving them. Because there's always an inside influence that will deceive you. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He wrote that so their own hearts would not be deceived. Do not deceive yourselves. 
Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That is the gospel. That is the word of God. So they, they worship this false god. So what happens to these people? What, what happened in these first six verses that we read? Not only did they sin by fashioning this false god, but I want you to know they sinned in their worship of their false god. The Bible says that they rose early on the next day. That's interesting. People often will rise early for a false god, but they often won't rise early for the real god. Listen, listen. I guarantee you, the ball fields were full this morning. Sunday school classes were empty this morning. You don't tell me they won't rise early for a false god. They'll leave Wyandotte County, be on the other side of Leavenworth County or the other side of Johnson County, 7 o'clock in the morning so they can play ball. That's a God in our lives. Right. Churches are trying to accommodate it, by the way. We're trying to, I, I've talked to church leaders. They're trying to shift their schedules. So we'll, we'll, we'll have something here so they can bring them, the ones that will bring them before they go. We'll have something here so the ones that will bring them after they go. We have all these false gods that, that take up our life. So they rose early. But notice the Bible says they, they rose early and they offered their offerings. And then the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That little phrase there, rose up to play, is a very important phrase. Hebrew scholars tell us it was a phrase that describes sexual immorality. And basically what happened here in their worship of this false god, their worship turned into a drunken sex party Right out there in the open. The most terrible form of debauchery happened. False worship. Worshiping a substitute in the name of Christ. One that we fashion will always result in sexual immorality. You know why? Because God is holy. And when it comes to sex, man has a hard time being holy. So we want a God that can accept our immorality. So we fashion a God that's not hard on sexual immorality. And you listen, you can study this down through the history of the church. Every time the church is in need of revival, sexual immorality in the church rises. The sexual standards of the church begins to lower. They, it begins to be accepted. We begin to accept sexual practices that we shouldn't. Now listen. There will always be and there always has been sexual sin in the church. Even in revival. Even in the greatest days of the church, people will sin sexually because people sin sexually. But that's different than it being the common practice in the life of the church. Revelation chapter 2, Jesus spoke to the church in Thyatira and he says this, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, look, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Did you notice in that text and in the last text we looked at, 1 Corinthians, sexual immorality was coupled with idolatry in both of them. So today in America, we have a God that has allowed us to slide in our, our morality. I talk to people all the time that are praying and sleeping with their boyfriend or their girlfriend. They're not repenting, but they're praying. People who are living in adultery, listen, divorce in the church is almost as high as it is outside the church. Living together is almost as high as it is outside the church. Now the church can't decide what to do with homosexuality. So we've got churches and denominations that are talking about you can be a Christian and be a homosexual. And now we're wondering, can they be members of the church? Can they be ministers of the gospel? I just read a text that told you they cannot. But then, not just them. A whole lot of other people that are living in sexual sin. We've substituted a false God for his presence. And we think grace means that God won't do anything. So the second thing we need to look at. Not only substitute God's. Um, but that. I want you to see substitute God's require something. Not, not just God's that 
our gods we can control and so forth, but they require something. For substitute gods to be real in our life, they require some things. One is they require worldly people, worldly people. See, the people of Israel had come out of Egypt, but the problem was Egypt had not come out of them. They were still acting like the people of Egypt. They were still living with the the morals and the thinking and the way of life, the priorities of the people of Egypt. They still wanted a God that would serve them, not a God they served. Many Christian people today go online and look in America, go, go online and look for sermons and find out how many you will find where anybody talks about worldliness. Nobody even talks about it. Most people in the church wouldn't know what it meant if you gave them a quiz. But the Bible talks about it over and over. Come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord. But in the church, we look at Look at that. What are you talking about? Because we've fashioned the people who are running alongside worldly, ungodly people. And the difference is we come to church and we pray, but we're all after the same thing. But if we're saved, we should be after God and his presence. We should be after knowing him. Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. So it, it requires a worldly people. But secondly, it requires weak leaders. Aaron had been left in charge, he and her, when Moses went up on the mountain. And Aaron proved to be a weak leader. Now there's two pastors in this passage, if you look at it this way. There's Pastor Moses, he's kind of like the senior pastor. And there's Pastor Aaron, his brother. He's like the executive pastor or the associate pastor. And we'll find out he's kind of in charge of all the staff. They got about a million or so people, by the way. So it's a rather large church. And uh, so they got all, they got, we'll see the Levites in a minute. Well, Aaron's in charge of all them. So he's kind of like the associate or the executive pastor. And Moses is going to go fasting and praying. And so he leaves Aaron in charge and tells the people, if you need anything, go to Aaron. Well, Notice some things about Pastor Aaron. One, Pastor Aaron gave the people what they wanted. They came to him and said, make a God for us. Aaron didn't even slow down. He didn't even blink. He said, okay, give me your idols. Give me your gold and I'll make you an idol. Give me your gold earrings. Break them off. I'll make you an idol. He gave the people what they wanted. Secondly, he gave the people more of what they wanted. He's a good, you know, entrepreneur. He's a good American. He saw it worked. Notice the Bible says there in verse 4, the people said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. He pulled that thing out of the fire and he says, man, they like it. They like it. So we'll make a feast to it. We'll make an altar to it. Man, we'll give them more of what they want. We'll ramp this thing up. They like it. It's working. See, in America, anything that works has to be good, right? That's the way we think. So he, he's like, yeah, it's working. See, Aaron didn't realize it, but he was like 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, that people will heap up teachers to suit their itching ears. And this is, unfortunately, this is what a lot of pastors and churches are doing. And not all of them. There's a lot of good pastors that are preaching the word. And, but there are some that are worried about keeping people happy, 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 and felt needs, and can we, you know, and... If we ramp this up and we get 100, let's ramp that up. Maybe we can get 200. Aaron gave the people more of what they wanted. Number three, Aaron followed the people. The people took the lead. I believe pastors should lead. I believe they should give direction. I, should, I believe they should give correction. I believe they should meet with leaders and seek the Lord. And he, the pastors should be with the leaders of the church, the spiritual people of the church, deacons and so forth, and get an idea of what God wants. But in the end, the pastor's job is not to follow the people. The people's job is to follow him. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And if I'm following Jesus and you're not following me, that's your sin. If I'm not following Jesus, that's my sin. Followed the people. Aaron followed them. Number four, when it all came down to it, Aaron blamed the people. So now Moses comes down off the mountain. We'll see this again in a minute. And he comes down off the mountain, and the first thing he does is he goes, he goes to Aaron, and he goes confront Aaron. Look at chapter 32, verse 21. Skip down there real quick. I know we're going to fill in the gaps. Maybe we'll get through today, or maybe we will. Y'all, y'all want to go through the whole thing? Yeah. Amen. Good. Good. I only needed one. Praise the Lord. We're going. 
And Moses said to Aaron, verse 21, What did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? Can you imagine God's going to say that to pastors? You brought a great sin on these people. You gave them what they wanted and they didn't want me. They wanted their own version of me and you didn't give them me. You brought a great sin on them. Verse 22. So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the, the people that they are set on evil. Moses, you know how sorry this bunch is. Well, you've been with these people, Moses. You know, you know they're rotten to the core. And you know what? He's right. Their heart was set on evil. Your heart's set on evil. My heart's set on evil. But your heart being set on evil is not my excuse for doing what's right. For not doing what's right. So he says, you know the people, man. Verse 23, for they said to, to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now he's telling on them. This is what they said about you, Moses. They said, he ain't ever going to come back. Forget him. <laughs> Verse 24, and I said to them, whoever has gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. Look at this. And I cast it into the fire and this calf came out. He's like, I just, threw, I just threw these earrings in there. Look what came out. These people, it's their fault. It's the fire's fault. These earrings they had, that was some cheap earrings they bought down at the Dollar Tree or something, and it just came out. Look at this. <laughs> Moses, Aaron blamed the people. Listen, this is funny, but it's sad. And there's a lot of pastors that are struggling with this too. Well, people will leave if I preach that. Well, people will leave if you preach it or if they don't, so just preach it, man. But there's another pastor, Pastor Moses. Look at, his, look at him. A couple things he did, and we'll run through this very quickly. Number one, Moses gave the people what they needed. They needed the law of God. They needed the truth of God. A pastor is to give us the law of God, the gospel of God, the word of God. That's what we need. He gave it what they needed. Number two, he led the people. He had already led them out. He was seeking to lead them in, but he led them. He didn't let them lead him. Number three, he rebuked the people. He was angry when he came down off the mountain. We'll read it in a moment. He, he throws the stones down and breaks the... Listen, he broke the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his finger. Not a good day at church. And so he breaks those, you know. And um, the buildings and grounds couldn't fix this either. So he was angry, but he goes and he rebukes them. And we're going to see it in a minute. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that same pass, passage... Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convinced, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He tells Timothy, Timothy, you got to preach the word in a convincing way. You got to rebuke them sometime. You got to exhort them. Be patient and teach them the word of God, but do it. Some Sundays you should leave here rebuked. You should leave here sometimes convinced, exhorted, because it's the word of God. Rebuke the people. Number four, he prayed for the people. You're going to see twice in this chapter, Moses is a picture of Jesus praying for these wayward people. I'm going to show you in a minute how he prayed and how much he loved these people. See, for a church, an individual, to have a substitute God that's not the true God in their life, they have to be wayward, worldly people who sit under weak leaders who won't preach the truth. I want to exalt Jesus when you come in here. Because he is the one true God, the way, the truth, and the life. And in the process of preaching that, I want to destroy any false God that you have. Amen. Number three, substitute God's bring. There's something that they bring with them. When they come into our midst, just like this situation, when they come into our midst, there are some things that are going to happen when we have substitutes. Number one, what's going to happen is the wrath of God is going to happen. Now, people don't believe that God's a God of wrath, but he's not a, he's, he hasn't changed. Look at verse 7. So they, they bring their false gods. They've got it. It popped out of the fire like Aaron said. Yeah. And verse 7 says this. And the Lord said to Moses, go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly and are out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
So the wrath of God is coming on them. Now notice verse number 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people, a, a people unwilling to change. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. You know what God does? God disowns them. Moses, they're your people now. They're stiff-necked. They're stubborn. They're unresponsive. But now listen, if you go back and you read chapter 19, right before he gave them the Ten Commandments, he says to Moses to tell these people, you are a special treasure to me of all the people in all the earth. So don't think God doesn't love these people. Somebody comes in and, you know, we're, we're wanting to hear John three sixteen every Sunday and we forget this God exists. He loved these people. He reminded them what he did to bring them out of Egypt. And he says, of all the people in the world, you're a special treasure to me. That's like me saying, of all the women in the world, Karen is a special treasure to me. She's mine. Of all the grandbabies in the world, <laughs> Ava's a special treasure to me. She's mine. God said that about those people. A special treasure to me. But because of this sin, and because of their turning their back on him and fashioning something besides him. God's anger is hot. There's people who believe this God doesn't exist. There are actually people who teach that there's a God of the Old Testament. And he changed in the New Testament. But listen, the Bible says very clearly. Malachi 3, 6, look at this. For I am the Lord God, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. He reminded them, because I don't change, this time I'm not consuming you. I could consume you because of your sin. But because I don't, con don't change, I'm not going to consume you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's wrath burns at false gods. Whether I set them up in my heart, this is why we don't have statues in the church that we pray to. Because God's wrath burns against that. And whether we preach another gospel that's no gospel at all, God's wrath burns against that. But secondly, look what happens. Not only does it bring the wrath of, of God, but it also brings the intercession of the godly. Somewhere, some godly people are going to see the displeasure of God and they're going to start praying. This is what Moses does. Look at verse 11. Chapter 32, verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Now Moses is giving them back to God. Did you notice? God called them Moses' people. Then Moses says, why do your wrath, your, hot, your, your wrath burn hot against your people? Right now nobody wants them. Moses don't want them. God don't want them. Just thought that was funny. Anyway. <laughs> Why should the Egyptian, now look, Moses is going to intercede. He's going to plead with God before I go into this. Moses is a picture of Jesus in this text. Because the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate who pleads our case with the Father. The Bible tells us Moses pleaded with God. And he's going to plead two things. He's going to ask God to spare them. The first thing he's going to say, God, I'm going to ask you to relent before your enemies. Verse 11, then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God. He asked, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Verse 12, why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. You know what Moses says, God, the Egyptians are going to say... You were powerful enough to bring them out, but you weren't powerful enough to bring them in. Don't let your people be an embarrassment to you. Do something in their life to change them. You ever pray this way? I pray this way for people. I got a couple people in my life that claim to be Christians. And I pray for them. God, these people are an embarrassment to your name. And God, don't let them be an embarrassment to your name. Do something to change them that they might forsake their sin and they might proclaim the name of Jesus and start living worthy of the calling of which they have received. They claim to be a Christian. God, work in their life that they might walk worthy of the calling they've received because their life is bringing shame to your name. So Moses says, hey, don't let them embarrass you before all of Egypt. 
But then he does something else. He asks God to remember his covenant. Relent from your wrath and remember your covenant. Verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. Not, and, and all this land that I have spoken of, you, I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. You know what he says? God, you made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these people are the result of that promise. God, you made some promises. Keep it. You ever remind God of his promises? I got some promises I believe God gave me hanging on my wall in my prayer room. And I remind God, God, about nine years ago, you, you spoke to my heart and said that was a promise for me. I've been praying for nine years. Please bring it to pass. See, godly people intercede. Matter of fact, I believe that this church probably for sure and many churches only exist today. Because when the church grows cold and backsliding, some people start praying and God has grace. One of the things a few of us learned on Wednesday night a few weeks ago, a man was teaching on prayer and he said this, a few can secure the blessing for the many. So let me tell you something. Some of you who are prayerless and careless, somebody else probably prayed you into some blessings. Moses is going to pray this wayward people. Now, the Bible says in verse 14, look at this. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. I don't have time to go into this deeply, but just this. People say, well, God changed his mind. What this means is God embarked on another course. You're going to see at the end, he doesn't totally consume them, but he does punish them. So that leads to the second thing. The third thing, there's the wrath of God. There's the... Uh, it, the uh, intercession of the godly, and finally, there's the division of the body. One of the things that happens is that substitute gods will bring about division in the church. I was just thinking about this. Ever since I've been a Christian, ever since I've been a Christian, I've heard people talk about so much division in the church. I, I, I was raised in the South. There was churches on every corner. You know Why? Because half the time, a bunch on this corner couldn't get along with the full bunch, and they moved on the other corner and started a church. They couldn't get along. Why can't people get along? I'll tell you why. Because you got false gods in your heart. And so this one bunch has this idea of God. This other bunch has this idea of God. And we just can't all get on the same page. And so we have all this disunity. But if people come to the one true God and bow down and start worshiping him, you know what God's going to do? He's going to be in the presence of that bunch. So what happens? We got a ways to go. I know your notes are done. I did that on purpose. Now we can all listen and learn. So what happens in this division of the body? Look at verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. Now Moses has been praying for him. God, remember these people. God's angry. This is so funny. Went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, and the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is the noise of war in the camp. But he said, It's not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing so Moses' anger became hot. God was hot on the mountain. Moses comes down and sees what's going on, and he's hot. And he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf, which they had made, burned it with fire, and ground it to powder. And he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel to drink it. The anguish and the anger of the leader. Now, when you read this, people say, well, Moses had a temper. Moses was a hothead. Well, he did have a temper. But there's more than a temper tantrum going on here. See, this is Moses' anger that's actually anguish. Because he loved these people. And I'm going to show you in a minute how much Moses loved them. Because he loved these people, the sin in their life caused him to anguish. Have you ever loved someone and they do things and you're angry at them. But it's more than just an anger like you would have when you watch television and you see some, somebody shoots and kills a little kid and you're angry about that and all the wickedness. You, we need to be somewhat angry about all the wickedness. But it's somebody that you love. 
And there's a deep anger in your heart because you know they know better and they shouldn't be doing this and they're destroying their lives or they're destroying their kids' lives. They're destroying your grandkids' lives and you love them, but there's a deep anguish. It's more than just that you're angry. There's a deep hurt down in your soul. Immediately when Moses saw this, it's not just that he was angry, I'm going to throw a fit. This was the cry of a broken heart deep down inside of him. And Moses throws these tablets down and he takes this. Imagine, I'm, I'm watching this. You know how bad a man Moses was? Moses is a bad dude. Think about it. There's, 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 they say it, over a million people there. Moses walks in and just takes the whole thing over. He just breaks this, this calf down, throws it in the fire. And then he sprinkles it in the water and he says, drink it. Drink it. Choke on it. He said, listen, I want you to choke on it. I want you to drink this. I want you to get a little taste of what this really is. And let me tell you something. The church in America is choking on our idols. We're choking on our substitute gods. We're choking on the things that we have set up in God's place. They're killing us. Well, then, not only the anguish of the leader, but look, the judgment of sin. Skip down to verse 25. Verse 25 Now, when Moses saw the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to the shame of their enemies. Aaron had not restrained them. You know what that means? When they came to Aaron, that Aaron should have told them, no. Remember, God just told us back on the mountain, no false gods, no graven images. I will not do it. You know why you need to come to a place and have somebody preach the word of God to you? It's because you need to be restrained in your sin. Everybody needs to be restrained in their sin. The Word of God has that rebuking and restraining effect on us. And you can mark it down. When we wander off from hearing the Word of God, it's because we've stopped listening and stopped being restrained. We need to be rebuked in our sin. And then there was the division. Look at verse 26. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, look at this. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourself today to the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. For every man has opposed his son and his brother. First thing that happens is, and God still does this, he says, Who's ever on my side, come here. Whoever's really with me, come. Whoever's really willing to lay down their false gods, come. We only find a small group was able to do that, willing to do that, by the way. The sons of Levi, these are the staff. I'm sure they were thinking when Moses said, take your swords, you got to go kill some folks. I'm thinking, they were probably thinking, they didn't teach me that in seminary. <laughs> There's a lot of things they don't teach you in seminary because they don't know. Because they don't know what you're going to face. So the Levites have to go out there on their side. They have to go out there and they have to inflict pain and suffering on people who, have in, who are going to inflict pain and suffering on the whole. And you know what? Godly people oftentimes have to deal with the mess of the ungodly in the church. Godly people oftentimes have to make up for the mess of the ungodly in the church. Moses called these people forward to take their stand. And some of them did. There's the last thing I want you to see. There was a visitation of punishment and the withdrawal of God. Look at verse number 30. I told you we're going to do this chapter. We're going to do it before lunch. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. I told you Moses rebuked them. Now look what he's going to do. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, now look at this. Yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. You know, Moses knew there was a book with names written down in the book of Exodus. 
That book's in the Bible in the book of Revelation as well. Moses knew it in Exodus. But notice what he says. If you're not going to forgive them, don't forgive me. Is there anybody like that? You'd be willing to say, God, if you're going to cast them out, just cast me out too. So don't think Moses didn't love these people. He loved them better than most of us love many people. But God corrects him. Look what he says. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. There's only one person who can take your place, and that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Moses couldn't take these people's place. You can't take your kid's place. I can't take your place. There's only one who can take your place in the judgment, and that's Jesus. Verse 34. Now, therefore, go. Lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. The Levites killed people with the sword, but that wasn't all. The Bible said God plagued them. Remember I told you 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about this? If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and you read verse 8, you know what it tells us? It tells us 23,000 people died that day because God plagued them. So God said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to consume them, Moses, because you prayed, but sin will be judged. And then he says something very interesting here. He says, look it down, and we're going to get into the next chapter very quickly. Look down to chapter 33 and um, verse 3. Look what he says. Well, verse, verse 2. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. I'm going to send my angel before you. But look at this. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. You know what he says? Because I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to clear a path for you, but I'm not going to walk with you. That's kind of like saying in the New Testament, because of your sin that you won't repent of, I've saved you. But I'm not going to be with you on earth. I'm going to turn you loose to go your own way. I don't want that. You want to walk in this life without God? I don't want God to tell me, because you're stiff-necked and you won't repent, I've saved you and you're mine, but I'll let you, I'll let you have your own end and your own choices, and I'll let you live with the consequences of your life without me on earth. All of this was said to point us to the fact that we need to do whatever it takes to cultivate God's presence in our life. Maybe you need to repent of a God you fashioned, a God who accepts all that stuff, all the excuses that you give him, a God who suits you instead of becoming a person who suits him. This morning, I want to ask you to repent of your version of God and seek the one true God who died for you, who loves you, and who is holy and wants you to walk with him and obey him. There may be someone here today, and the truth of the matter is you've never been saved. You've never repented at all. You're a pretty good person. But the Bible says all have sinned, and the wages of sin is death, and Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And the only way to heaven is Jesus, and whosoever calls on his name shall be saved. And if you've never been saved, today is your day of salvation. Because not only will God not walk with you on earth, he won't take you to heaven. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. Do you know him today?